Hey, Exodus Church, Pastor Kyle here. I hope you are doing well on this beautiful morning. Here I am in my office. I wanted just to record a short message for you, a short word of encouragement for you this morning as we are still unable to gather together. One of the themes throughout this time apart during this quarantine has been to hopefully cultivate a hunger uh, an appetite to come back together and to worship, to, to hear, to feed on God's word, uh, to eat the Lord's Supper together uh, and rejoice in the blessings and the goodness of our Lord and Savior. I hope and I pray that that is something that the Lord has been doing in your life, that you are indeed hungry uh, to come back together and feast on the blessings uh, that come from the Lord. And as I was thinking about uh, just the power of the gospel, uh, we see that the gospel is for those who are hungry, right? The gospel speaks to those who have an appetite. The, the gospel fulfills uh, the needs that we have in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our lives. The gospel is for the hungry. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament that proclaims the gospel, I think with such clarity and such poetic power, is Isaiah 25 verses six through nine. This is a passage that we have read for our calls to worship and other readings. It's been referenced many times uh, throughout uh, our days together as Exodus Church. And I, I just love the, the, the beauty of this passage. So hear these words from Isaiah 25, six through nine. It says this, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for his peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, uh, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that casts over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his peoples he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And then in verse 9 it says this, it will be said on that day, that glorious day that is coming. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. And praise be to God. This is indeed a powerful passage in Isaiah 25 that foretells, that looks forward, that anticipates the coming kingdom, the coming king who will renew the whole world, that he will, uh, he will reverse the, the curse. He will, he will make well what has gone bad in the sin of humanity. This is a proclamation of the good news. Here's some of the, the phrases of this passage. It tells us that the veil that stands between us and God will be removed. Isaiah says that death will be swallowed up forever. And God will wipe away every tear from the faces of his people. He says that the reproach, and that is our shame, uh, the shame of his people will be taken away. And then he ends with that doxological, uh, praiseworthy phrase, let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. Each of these promises we see being fulfilled in the very person and work of Jesus Christ. God tore the veil that stood between us and him when Jesus was hanging upon that cross. If you remember the story, the centurion sees, in Mark's gospel, the centurion sees that the veil had been torn and he looks to Jesus and he says, surely this man was the son of God. Jesus, by bearing our sin, removed any barrier that would keep us from the Father. Not only that, but we see that Christ is the one who has swallowed up death. He is our death eater. He absorbed it into himself so that we no longer have to be weighed down by the curse of death and the penalty of death. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says that death has been swallowed up by victory. So in the resurrection of Jesus, death has been swallowed up, it has been removed, it has been taken away by the victory of Christ, our King. And then we see in Revelation, near the end, uh, that day that is described when God is dwelling with man and what does he do? But he wipes all the tears away from the eyes and the faces of his people. 
This passage in Isaiah 25 is indeed a gospel passage because it proclaims the good news of the gospel. I think this is important for us to really think about that. The gospel is a proclamation of good news. It is not a sharing of good advice. And oftentimes we think about the gospel in that way. We think of it as sharing good advice, like maybe sharing financial advice or sharing uh, good advice on, on how to uh, raise your kids or how to manage your home. Uh, this is good advice, but good news is something far greater than that. Good news is true whether we see it or believe it or not. It is good news that the King has come. The gospel of Jesus Christ is this. It is the good news that the promised King has come. And through his death, resurrection, and ascension, he has brought you into the family of God and has given you a seat at his table. The gospel ends with us sitting around the table of our Lord and eating with him. We don't often think about food as being a part of the gospel message or the gospel promise. But if we look throughout the scriptures, we see that this is actually a great theme. In fact, we see it in this passage that we looked at in Isaiah 25. In verse 6, it says this, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. This theme of food uh, is connected to the gospel all throughout the scriptures. In fact, this is one of the very first themes in the Bible. Man was created in the image of God and he was created hungry. He was created in need of food. So right after God creates Adam, he brings him to the garden and shows him the tree of life and says, this is for you, this is for you to eat. And whenever Adam ate of the, the tree of life, specifically the tree of life, uh, he was eating with the Lord. That, is, that was the Lord's table, if you would, that they would gather together around the tree of life and they would eat and they would commune and they would be uh, together in relationship. And then what we see happening is when Adam and Eve sinned, they were removed from the garden for a reason, so that they might not go back and eat of the tree of life. You see, the curse of sin makes it so we can't sit at the table with God, that we can't fellowship with him. Thus, there's that veil, that barrier between us and God. So really the theme of the Bible is how, or one of the themes of the Bible would be God's work to bring humanity back to his table. And that's part of the good news of the gospel, that, it, that in Christ, God has done just that. He has brought humanity back out of, out of the wilderness, out of slavery, out of the slums, and he has brought them back and has seated us at his table around the tree of life. Luke's gospel uh, is a gospel that tells us that God indeed feeds the hungry, that God is bringing the hungry back to his table. This is one of the main themes in, in Luke's gospel. In fact, there are 10 different meals in Luke's gospel that highlight this. And each one of them helps us paint the picture of sinful people coming back and sitting at God's table. The first meal that we see in Luke's gospel is in chapter 5, where Jesus calls Levi, the tax collector, to come and follow him. And what does Levi do? But he gets all of his friends together. He throws a big party and invites Jesus to come. So here we now have God eating with sinners and tax collectors. And of course, this makes the Pharisees upset. The scribes and the Pharisees grumble about this. And then we go a little bit further in Luke. And in chapter 7, we see the second meal. And it's during a dinner with another Pharisee that a sinful woman comes in, broken because of her sin, crying. And she's, she's wetting the feet of Jesus with her tears, and she's drying his feet after washing them with her, her hair, and she takes her ointment and anoints his feet. So here, Jesus sitting at a table with a sinner, a prostitute, a woman who uh, would be unworthy to sit his, at his table. And the Pharisees likewise complain about this. Jesus, if you would have known who she was, you would never have let her in here. And Jesus says, these are the people I have come to save. We go on in Luke's gospel and we see that Jesus creates these abundant feasts for people 
In Luke chapter 9, we see Jesus feeding the 5,000. In Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus eating a meal with his disciples and Mary and Martha are there. And you remember the story, Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening, talking, hearing what the Savior is saying while Martha is busy serving. There's lots to do. And Martha comes up to Jesus and says, can you tell Mary to help me out here? I'm working my fingers to the bone. I'm busy and she's not helping at all. And Jesus says, you need to calm down, Martha, for Mary has chosen what is better. You see, around the Lord's table, uh, it is better to commune, to listen, to teach, to be taught by the Father than it is just to serve him. It's a beautiful picture of our lives that he has called us to come and rest around his table. We keep going in Luke and we see the fifth uh, meal that is shared and it's in chapter 11 where you have uh, some Pharisees and scribes inviting Jesus to come and eat with them and they're watching him very closely and Jesus doesn't wash his hands. He doesn't go through the ceremonial washing before sitting down to eat. And the Pharisees get upset about this and question him, why wouldn't you wash before you come and eat? And Jesus essentially tells him that you're worried about washing your hands, but how are you gonna wash your hearts? That your, your inside also needs to be washed. So when we are invited to the, to the Savior's table, to the Lord's table, we come as men and women who have been washed inside and out. The next meal comes, uh, there's three meals that come in Luke chapter 15. There's a celebration feast after the lost sheep was found. There's a celebration feast after the lost coin was found. And there's a celebration feast after the lost child, the prodigal son, was found. And then we see in chapter 18, Jesus eating with Zacchaeus, another sinner, a tax collector, uh, one that had a horrible reputation. Yet Jesus comes and he sits and he eats with this sinner. And then in chapter 22 of Luke, we see the greatest meal instituted with the Lord's Supper that Jesus institutes, a meal that we get to partake of every week when we gather together, where we as, as broken individuals, having been washed, having been cleansed, having been renewed, having been restored in the gospel, we come as family members of God and sit around his table and we eat and we feast with our Lord and Savior. The final meal that we see in Luke's gospel is after the resurrection where Jesus appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and he breaks bread with them. And it's not until eating that the disciples' eyes are opened up and they saw who he was. Because before, that, before they ate together, Jesus told him about how the whole Old Testament points to him. He showed him how the, the Old Testament testifies and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the King. I would imagine that Jesus probably went to Isaiah 25 and showed them, you see on this mountain, the tears being wiped away, the, the reproach being gone, the feast that is given is fulfilled in him. And after telling him the, the disciples these things, they ate together. And as soon as they ate of the bread, their eyes were open and they saw who he was. And then finally, Jesus shares a final meal with his disciples before ascending into heaven. Church, this is the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus has come to take uh, from all the corners of the earth, broken, sinful people. He's washed them, he's cleansed them, he's renewed them, he's restored them in the gospel. And now he has brought us to his table where we eat with our Lord. Church, this indeed is the, go the, the gospel and Jesus in himself embodies this glorious truth. The glorious truth that the gospel is that the promised king has come and through his death, resurrection, and ascension, he has brought you into his family and has given you a seat at his table. This has been a, a lonely time for a lot of you. To not be able to fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ is a, a painful thing. It's a real challenge. The stress of uh, your, your, your jobs and the security of your jobs and financial security is one that can lead to despair. Though these challenges are real, we are not to be men and women who suffer without hope, but rather we suffer with hope. We suffer with hope because we have hope 
that we are indeed a part of the family of God. We have confidence that he has called us to his table. He has called us his own. That he has covered us with his righteousness. And that he has given us every reason to rejoice. Look with me again at Isaiah 25, 9. It says this, It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in our salvation. Church, as we wait to gather back together, as we wait to eat of the Lord's Supper again together, let us do so with gladness and rejoicing in our hearts because he has saved you. He has taken you from that miry pit and he has brought you into his presence. He has redeemed you, he has renewed you, he has restored you. He has made you a son and a daughter of the king and he has brought you to his table and at his table there's peace and blessing. Church, be encouraged by this, that you are not far away, that God is not far away, but rather we are together even this morning around the table of our Lord, celebrating, being joyful, being glad that he is our salvation. God bless.